James Webb, please join me here on stage. As I tell the audience a little more about you, I will not give the whole, um, the whole story. But now, James is the research manager for continental and Mediterranean Europe with Wood Mackenzie. Um, and has also covered Norway as an analyst and, of course, the North Sea um, in general. Um, James is an economist from the University of Aberdeen, and prior to working for Wood Mackenzie, uh, he worked in the investment industry. So what could be more appropriate than giving you the next 30 minutes? Please. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Webb. Uh, you've been saved, the Wood Mackenzie story, by uh, David, thankfully. Saved me as well. Um, the title of my presentation is where's the good news in the North Sea? I was very uh, pleased to be invited back by Oil & Gas Denmark. And although a lot has changed since I last spoke, many of the problems that exist in the North Sea are still the same. We've got a lack of discovered resources, we've got aging infrastructure, and we've got a high cost environment. And it's very easy to point them out. And to compound our misery, as David pointed out, the oil price has halved since I was last on this stage. You've got to try a little bit harder to scratch beneath the surface and find out where are the signs of recovery, where is the good news in the North Sea, something that can direct strategy going forward. Now, I agreed my title before I found out I had to speak for 30 minutes. And as hard as I scratch, I'm not going to be able to discuss all the benefits of the North Sea for 30 minutes. So we will cover off the problems. But as promised, I will leave on a kind of ending note about where the good news is in the industry and how we can take this sector forward. So let's look at some of the problems first. And exploration is a good starting block. Without exploration, we would have no discussion about costs because there would be no developments to have. And there would be no discussion about fiscal take, because there would be no production. Well, here we've plotted the last five years of discovered resources and millions of barrels of oil equivalent across the North Sea. It's pretty constant, if we exclude 2010, which was thanks to the Johan Sverdrup discovery in Norway, which blew out all proportions. But normally, the North Sea delivers around 1 billion barrels of oil equivalent a year in new resources. But if we drill down to the data, there are some trends and there are some regional differences. The Norwegian sector has accounted for 80, 90% of those discovered resources every year. The UK, Denmark, and the Netherlands is really lagging behind. So how does the North Sea rank globally? Well, I've taken Norway, the UK, and Denmark and compared them to the global averages. This doesn't make great reading either. Only Norway has a higher success rate than the global average, and all of them have a lower average discovery size than the globe. But this isn't to write off the North Sea. This is about finding the position and the place that um, the North Sea is in the global landscape. Of course, the average discovery size will be smaller than, um, or sorry, the North Sea's average discovery size will be lower than the global average. Norway benefits from having frontier areas like the Barents, but the UK, the Netherlands, and Denmark are much more mature. Knowing where you are, taking a benchmarking exercise like this, it's all about finding out where you stand in the global sector and making an industry that's fit for purpose and can attract investment no matter what the story. So one of the benefits of being a mature sector is the infrastructure. Now here I've noted the development times or the lead times. That's taking the date of a discovery and how long it takes to first production at oil fields. Now, I've removed extended reach drilling, which obviously takes very little time at all. But you can see the average um, lead times for discoveries made post-1990 and now on stream are not too bad, averaging between 5 and 10 years. 
However, it's important to note there are new plays, like the North American Unconventionals, that take a matter of months to bring production on. The North Sea must work hard to make sure that the infrastructure that they have is used to bring down lead times. Although the developments may be smaller, you can benefit economically from a quicker return by bringing that production forward, and something we should think about going forward in the North Sea. So looking at costs, this is a huge story and development problems. Here I've platted, plotted all the greenfield projects that are pre-FID in the North Sea. And we set them against their break-even price. That's to generate a 10% rate of return in Brent US dollar terms. As you can see, at today's Brent oil price of $50, a large number of these projects did not generate that return. And although you might suggest that 50 maybe is too low, David projected uh, an oil price recovery. But can you imagine the risk that, that a company has to take, an operator has to take, to invest huge amounts of capital in a project that at today's prices doesn't make enough money? It makes it very difficult. But let's drill down a little bit further. The light blue bars that you can see are on a pre-tax basis. So that's removing tax from the, the fiscal uh, or from the economic calculations. So assuming com or fields pay no tax whatsoever. The fields that do not break even at under $50 per barrel have what we call a cost problem. There are the capital to bring these projects on stream is too high for the resources. That's for the operators, that's for the supply chain to fix. The dark blue bars are post-tax. So that's the additional price that you need to generate in order to keep those returns and pay your taxes. What happens here is some fields that are economic are pushed higher and are uneconomic in this price environment. Of course, all this means is that we can identify projects that could benefit from incentives or marginal incentives. And it's this collaborative approach. One solution will not fix this problem. One solution will not fix this slide. It's about having an industry where operators, the service sector, and governments can work together to resolve this cost issue. And it can't all be about tax, because everyone hurts. And the government's included in this. Here in the area charts, the colored area charts, We've plotted the uh, kind of indicative um, fiscal returns of all of the North Sea countries in today's uh, profile, today's oil price. The red dotted line shows what we expected 18 months ago in mid-2014. Uh, you can see that the huge white gap has occurred where fiscal revenues that the government expected to have have changed. They are a stakeholder in this industry, and when their uh, revenues have been hit so hard, asking them to take an additional hit is very difficult. And this is where collaboration really comes to the front. How much do people want to set this industry up for the better? Everyone, the supply chain, the operators, and the governments are feeling the impact of a low oil price environment. So how do these fiscal regimes stack up against the global average? I've done a similar thing as I did for exploration. I'm very sorry that this is a very busy slide and it's probably a little bit bright for uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon, but bear with me. What you have here is two kind of, okay, there's three different regimes, but two different styles. On one hand, you have the Norwegian system, which is very much high tax. However, it's very good for new entrants. A new entrant into Norway with no tax-paying position can recover 80% of its exploration costs in the same year. Government will almost literally write you a check for 80% of your exploration costs. Of course, that benefits new entrants. It encourages activity. But on the flip side, they can ask for that high rate of tax. In the UK and Denmark, you have systems where the tax rate is in line or lower 
than the global average. However, the systems really benefit existing producers, offering little incentive to new entrants or new capital spend. I'll come back to the UK, don't worry. Infrastructure. The UK in particular has an infrastructure problem. Here I'm highlighting some of the work that our UK team put together. It's focusing on infrastructure in the northern North Sea of the UK. The red infrastructure that's highlighted here are infrastructure that we believe has less than a 15% utilization rate at the moment. We're not saying that this infrastructure will close down, but what we're saying is that without an effort to save this infrastructure, it could be at risk. And it's extremely important that this infrastructure stays in place. As we talked about with exploration, the cornerstone, if discovery sizes are getting lower, to commercially produce them, you need to have this infrastructure in place. And what's at risk? Well, if you take the worst case scenario and all of the infrastructure that we have on this chart that generates or has a utilization of less than 15% closes down, there'll be 300 million barrels of oil that are discovered that's left in the ground. These are huge numbers. And this isn't just a UK problem. Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands all have their own infrastructure problems and will continue to do so. And shaping the strategy for the North Sea going future must address any infrastructure problems. This is just looking at the Northern North Sea. It goes well beyond this. This is just a slice of the pie. So good news. I know you're all pleased to hear it. I've been a bit gloomy so far. Starting with exploration. And let's focus in a little bit more for Denmark. Here I've shown the exploration performance over the last 10 years. But rather than show absolute volumes found, I've shown MMBOE per well, so per exploration well delivered. And although Denmark, uh, Norway stands out again, Denmark looks pretty good. Denmark has bumper years where large resources can be found despite a low number of exploration wells being driven, drilled. This tells me there's still potential. This is not a scenario where the UK has, uh, and Netherlands have both had very low levels of um, reserves per well being drilled, but actually a high number of exploration wells being drilled. In Denmark, the reverse is true. We've had bumper years, we've had good discoveries, we've had soul sorts, we've had Hyras, and hopefully Zana as well. And these discoveries being made with a few numbers of wells. So coming on to wells. Exploration is one of the first things that's hit in an industry when the oil price collapses. And I was startled to find that between the 1st of January and the 7th of October, in 2015, only three wells were drilled fewer than the same time period in 2014 in the North Sea. Three. But again, drilling down, let's look beneath that. The countries that have supported this are the UK and Norway. They've had a huge increase in exploration, exploration wells being drilled. You know, and you can look back at some of the decisions that both of these companies have, uh, countries have made and what's spurring that. Both Netherlands and Denmark have seen the number of exploration wells or being spudded decline dramatically. So once we have a development that's going ahead, at the, you've seen the oil price collapse, what's the saving grace? Well, one of the saving graces for operators in a low oil price environment is cost deflation. Cost deflation has happened because activity in the sector has fallen off a cliff. This year we expect five greenfield projects to be sanctioned globally. If you look back over the last five, ten years, that number has been more like 30 to 50. If you have a supply chain that's built for 30 to 50 greenfield projects, of course there's an overcapacity in the sector and you will be able to bring uh, prices down. This survey we ran of 100 upstream clients asked them how much cost deflation for like for like were they seeing in these sectors between 2015 
and 2014. Although they're varied across different sectors, we had a kind of weighted average for your offshore development. And we estimate that around 15% cost reductions in capital spend at new developments can take place from supply chain savings alone. But it can't stop there. If you have an oversupplied or oversupplied service sector, the natural response is to cut capacity. And we've seen this with a huge number of job layoffs. And we've seen it with uh, the rig markets, rigs being taken out, etc. What has to happen to make these projects, in, and David touched upon having a 30 to 50% cost reduction, is that operators themselves have to look at re-optimizing their designs, making them appropriate for a $50 world. You know, no longer is the discussion about producing absolutely everything in a reservoir. It has about what can you produce economically. And for the longer run, if we want to keep costs down, squeezing the supply chain will only work to some extent. And the engagement has to happen so that costs remain lower. One piece of good news that's often forgot about is local currency depreciation, which is benefiting operators and the supply chain alike. Operators who have US dollars on their balance sheet but have local spend in terms of Norwegian kroner or Danish kroner can take advantage of these currency fluctuations to bring their costs down. And local supply chain, suddenly they have become a lot more competitive against the companies quoting either in US dollars or even GBP. So tax, hitting tax on the head. And where's the good news? Well, the UK was one of the first countries to respond to the low oil price, They're trying to address some of its problems. Looking to lower the tax rate for existing production, make sure that that production stays there for longer ensuring that infrastructure remains. And it's also sought to simplify and broaden its investment allowance to make sure that new investment is encouraged um, to bring new resources on stream. Now, the big difference in the UK has been that you know, they've had poor exploration success, but they do have existing uh, huge fields in production, they do have the infrastructure there, and they have a large number of marginal projects. The new investment allowance allows companies to offset over 60% of their new capital investment against the supplementary charge tax. You know, it's really encouraging, and hopefully we'll get some of the marginal fields in the UK off the ground and moving forward, addressing that problem of infrastructure. And another country that's tried to address the problem of marginal field developments is the Netherlands, who have a very specific marginal field tax incentive. Marginal fields, which, or the tax incentive, which was introduced, uh, introduced in 2010, allows specific fields to have an additional 25% capex uplift against their tax. Now, the government introduced this to monetize stranded fields and tie them into existing infrastructure, infrastructure, preserving their life. It's been hugely beneficial. The Netherlands does not publish any record of which projects have this incentive. It's quite secretive. But we estimate 16 projects have been developed and brought on stream with these um, fiscal incentives. It sounds like a, a few projects. But the results are really confounding. You know, out to 2022, or in 2022, we expect that the production from these 16 fields to contribute 20% of the Dutch production, excluding the Groningen, of course. Now, that's a huge number from fields that were considered stranded or uneconomic in the future. And it's going to be a real part of the Netherlands strategy going forward. Now, not many people recognized, but expiry on this incentives in 2016. So if there's anyone operating in the Netherlands, get your bids in now. Um, but hopefully the success of this incentive will encourage this to be re-implemented and reintroduced in the years going forward. And it's certainly a blueprint for other, company, or other countries 
looking to implement something similar. And what's the end result? Well, here I want to have a bit of good news where if something goes well, it can go well. Brownfield developments taking existing projects or existing fields and having incremental drilling or water injection, as we've heard already discussed today, can add significant volumes to production. And here I've shown the Danish field dam. The dark blue section shows our estimated production, Wood Mackenzie's estimated production, in 2002. Um, we did cover it well before 2002, but believe it or not, we used to write it down on paper. So <laughs> I thought for time, uh, 2002 would do. And we've also shown our profile, or expected production profile, in 2013. Now this is brownfield activity taking place here. And you can see the extra production and extra life expectancy from just one field focusing on brownfield investments. But like Greenfield, brownfields have to make sense economically. And making sure that brownfield investments are a strategic and attractive part of the investment cycle is extremely important in mature basins like the North Sea. So the end result, so what's the good news? Has there been anyone being able to take advantage of some of the kind of signs of life that I've kind of scratched the surface on? And yes, five projects, as I've mentioned, have been sanctioned globally. Three of them have been in the North Sea. If you're trying to guess which one is left out, it's Johan Speardrop. Uh, for reasons that uh, operator announced some cost deflation, which we're now remodeling and factoring in, and a little bit sensitive. Um, but the remaining two North Sea fields, Maria and Kulain, are on the board. What's happened here is the operators, the supply chain, in some instances, the governments, have been able to collaborate and reduce the capex per BOE at these projects, improving the economics so that they reach a threshold that you can take investment for. Reaching this goal has allowed these projects to go ahead in the current oil price environment. And you're a real sign that the industry can respond to the situation we're in and through collaboration work. So a few key takeaways. There is good news out there. It's not all doom and gloom. But this presentation wasn't about you know, saying everything is well in the North Sea, nor was it trying to talk about all the problems or the, all the issues we have. What's highlighting here is looking at the North Sea through the, you know, a global perspective. We have to realize that in this environment, the competition for investment is higher than ever. And we really need to focus on, as the North Sea, finding our place in the global environment and making sure our sector is geared up and ready so when oil prices do recover, then we're ready to take advantage of that and we can maximize the value from the North Sea for years to come. I'd like to thank you all for listening and look forward to taking questions shortly.